The first recorded Viking attack in Britain was in 793 at Lindisfarne in the Kingdom of Northumbria. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicles tells us of the event. A great famine, and after that, in the same year, the harrying of the heathen, miserable, to destroyed God's church in Lindisfarne by rapine and slaughter. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicles also record the first time the Vikings came to Britain in 787, although there may have been earlier visits just not recorded, but in this case, they killed the magistrate. The subsequently named Viking Age would see great changes in Britain and Ireland. Now we will explore the Welsh Kingdom's history with the Vikings. To begin with, the word Viking is a sort of umbrella term similar to Celtic, as when we look under the umbrella, we see various names given, for example, Norse, Norse men, Danes, Northmen, Raiders, Sea Raiders, Rus, etc. And depending on the source, particularly Christian sources, they wrote down any word that meant raider or pirate. The Annals of Wales tell us that in 796, the first coming of the Gentiles among the Southern Irish. The Oxford Dictionary gives the following definition of the word Viking. A member of a Scandinavian people who attacked and sometimes settled in parts of Northwest Europe, including Britain, in the 8th to 11th centuries. While the description given is not a bad description, it is not wholly accurate. People from Scandinavia during the time of the Vikings in the 8th to 11th centuries did more than just raid and settle in parts of Europe. They were traders, craftsmen, mercenaries, farmers, bards, explorers and conquerors, etc. There had always been raiders or pirates. The Vikings were the most famous of them, and to the Welsh kingdoms they had dealt with people raiding and settling before, the Germanics and the Irish before the Vikings. Depicted as barbarians by some accounts, however, if we take a look at the sophisticated ships they used to travel across the seas and rivers, that's just one indication that they were more than just pagan barbarians. Yet, there would be a noticeable difference between the Danes that attacked Lindisfarne in 796 to the ones that invaded England in 1066 with Harold Hardrada. For one, there would be a difference of religion. By 1066, most of Scandinavia was Christian, and we don't know which part of Scandinavia the Vikings that plundered Lindisfarne came from, whereas Harold Hardrada, who is sometimes referred to as the last great Viking and one of the most famous ones, was from Norway. If we look at some of the chroniclers' descriptions of the Vikings, both Christian and Muslim sources, the historian Dudo, based in France here, offers this about the Viking age and expansion. These people who insolently abandon themselves to excess indulgence live in outrageous union with many women, and there, in shameless and unlawful intercourse, bred innumerable progeny. Once they have grown up, the young quarrel violently with their fathers and grandfathers, or with each other, about property, and if they increase too greatly in number, and cannot acquire sufficient arable land to live on, a large group is selected by drawing of lots according to ancient custom, who are driven away to foreign peoples and realms, so that they, by fighting, can gain themselves countries where they can live and continual peace. The Islamic sources on the Vikings are rich and full of interesting details. One Islamic scholar, Ahmed ibn Fadlan, who encountered Norsemen at the king of the Bulgars' court near the river Volga, he describes them. I have seen the Rus as they came on their merchants' journeys and encamped by the Volga. I have never seen more perfect physical specimens, tall as date palms, blonde and ruddy. Each man wore a garment, which covered his body on one side and left one side free for action. Each man carried an axe, a Frankish type sword and a knife with him. Tattoos covered him from fingertip to neck. They drink wine excessively day and night. 
Ahmed further comments on them being heathens and that their washing habits were not the most hygienic. If we look at one of the best preserved Viking towns, the description some of the chroniclers have given us get disproved quite quickly. One of the most lucrative source of information on a Norse town during the Viking period is Hedeby, as the archaeological evidence shows us that Hedeby was a centre for trade in the region. The town also had plenty of commercial ventures from merchants, craftsmanship, shipbuilders, etc. Fine goods were also made. The town also minted coinage. As we've mentioned many times before, coinage is an excellent way to showcase or solidify a king's or chieftain's authority. Some of these enterprises are dated as early as the 8th century. The town also featured the first church in Denmark, constructed during the height of the Viking Age in 850. So the quality of the goods being made and traded contradict what some of the chroniclers recorded of Norse society. Now that we've covered a brief outline about who the Vikings were and a small part of their culture and history, we can now look at the impact they had on Wales and the Welsh kingdoms. Wales is the unique one in Britain, as unlike the areas in which today are modern day England and Scotland, there was never a major large settlement by the Norsemen to the scale of say, for example, the Dane law in England, which was the areas in England settled by the Norse. Or in Scotland's case, parts of the mainland and the Isles, which would later become the Kingdom of the Isles. There were small scale settlements, which we will come to, yet Wales did suffer many raids by the Vikings, along with trading with them, and in some cases, even hiring the Vikings to use against or ally with against other Welsh kings, as well as against the emerging power of the Kingdom of Wessex. The first recorded named victim of the Viking raids in Wales was a Welshman called Cynin. The Annals of Wales state, Cynin is killed by the Gentiles. We don't know who this person was. The Welsh sources, like other sources, had various names for the Vikings. We will now look at each kingdom in Wales and the history of the Vikings there. Let's start with Gwenith and a particular location, Anglesey, an island just off the coast of Gwenith. Anglesey was important to the Kingdom of Gwenith as the island featured the capital, Aberthaw, from the 9th century onwards, as well as being the major food provider from fishing to farming thanks to the flatness and fertile lands. The Vikings raided the island in 853 AD. In 856, the Vikings attacked again, led by a man called Gorm or Orm. Yet the Vikings would suffer a defeat inflicted by the King of Gwyneth, Rodri, later known as Rodri the Great. We will get into his life in the final episode, The Great Kings of Wales. The battle at Anglesey was a great victory for the Welsh. Although we lack significant details on the battle itself, the victory brought a claim for Rodri, as the Viking leader was killed. Anglesey would be safe for a time. The pagan Vikings still raided many churches and monasteries in Wales, similar to everywhere in Britain and Ireland, as they were easy targets to loot and the monks that were enslaved would be worth something as well. The Viking activity in Gwenith for a time after the battle was simple hit and run raids, hitting small coastal areas or Christian sites. As Wales's terrain is not as flat as say for example England, so large scale raids across Wales would be more difficult than in England. Yet the Vikings would set up shop for trading for the day before returning to their ships and some place names in Wales are directly influenced by the Vikings, potentially indicating settlements or integration with the local population. The arrival of the Vikings would see warfare between the English kingdoms and the Welsh kingdoms simmer down for a time, allowing Rodri to consolidate his kingdom and expand. 
as perhaps his victory over the Vikings made the Norse warbands think twice before attacking. In 865, the great heathen army arrived, attacking and looting across England, as well as placing puppet kings on the thrones of Northumbria and the once great enemy of the Welsh, the Kingdom of Mercia, which was split in two. And while the great heathen army never attacked the Welsh kingdoms, their actions in the English kingdoms would have an effect, as more Viking attacks began on Wales from 871 onwards, and in 877, King Rodri had to flee his kingdom to Ireland to gather troops as the Vikings from Dublin attacked Anglesey and the invading force overwhelmed Rodri's initial defences. He did return in 878, yet in the same year, the Viking puppet king of Mercia, Caelwulf, perhaps with some troops from the great heathen army, attacked and killed Rodri in battle. And again, we don't have the details on the battle, but his sons would avenge his death against the Mercians at the Battle of Conway, which the Annals of Wales state as The Battle of Conway, Vengeance for Rodri at God's Hand. The next mention of the Vikings in Gwyneth is that the eldest son of Rodri attempted to ally with the Viking Kingdom in York in order to counter the powerful English Kingdom of Wessex, which had taken Mercia's place as the dominant power in Britain, as under their king, Alfred, later known as Alfred the Great. He had led his troops to victory over the Vikings at the Battle of Eddington in 878. This new powerhouse was a threat to Gwyneth, but the alliance with the Vikings in York did not last as in 893, a new army from Scandinavia started raiding. The threat of this Norse army was enough that the Welsh and the English joined forces to defeat them at the Battle of Buttington. Before the battle, the Viking army had moved into Gwyneth after capturing the fortified city of Chester. The sons of Rodri, however, resisted the Vikings and due to the fierce resistance by the men of Gwyneth, the Norsemen headed southwards, clashing with the English-Welsh army there. The actions caused by the Norsemen and their fellow Welshmen invading each other left the Welsh kingdoms little choice but to accept, whether willingly or begrudgingly, the overlordship from the Kingdom of Wessex under Alfred. Despite this cooperation between the Welsh and Wessex, the Vikings would conduct an enormously destructive raid as the Annals of Wales state. The Northmen came and laid waste Cliger and Gwent. All of these locations are south of Gwyneth. We can only speculate why the Vikings didn't attack Gwyneth. A band of Norsemen did attack Anglesey in 903, as this group was driven from Dublin by the Irish. But what little settlement they tried to create was soon overwhelmed and forced to flee by the army of Gwyneth. After this period, the Viking activity in Gwyneth declined to opportunistic raids. The next time the Vikings play any prominent role in Gwyneth, other than an attack on the capital in 693, was in the 970s, where two rival claimants for the throne had both hired Viking mercenaries. And at the start of the same decade, Norse raids were on the rise again, so much so that the Welsh kings met with the now king of the English, Edgar. Wessex had evolved into the Kingdom of England thanks to the children of Alfred the Great conquering the remaining English kingdoms and the Danelaw lands in the north of England. The meeting was set up in 973 in order for alliances and agreements to be made to protect each kingdom from further Viking attacks or attempted territorial conquests. As in 972, a named Viking leader called Godfrey launched a raid on Anglesey. Godfrey would later ally with a Welsh prince, whose father was a previous king of Gwyneth, but was overthrown. This army then invaded Gwyneth in 980, but was defeated and the former prince was killed in the battle. Godfrey escaped and returned in 987 during an opportunistic time as Gwyneth had been conquered by another great king, Maladid, king of Dehaibarth. 
as he had just conquered Gwyneth in 986. Maradid didn't have the time to centralise and consolidate his new kingdom, so when Godfrey invaded Anglesey, Maradid retreated to South Wales. The raid conducted was so devastating that we have records of people taken into slavery. Some 2,000 men were taken captive as slaves and later ransomed back. The last raid in Anglesey by the Vikings in the early Middle Ages occurred in 993, as the year 1000 is the start of the High Middle Ages, and this series covers the early Middle Ages. So now we've covered the Viking's history in Gwyneth. In the next episode, we will view the history of the other Welsh kingdoms and how the Vikings made their mark.